called Common Ground. I started it with some people back in 1995 at the Acme Theater where we used to be on La Brea. The Acme Theater no longer exists and we put the project to bed for 22 years. We re-emerged it, re-awoke it last year uh, with Rob Brownstein in the active space of the Hudson Theater simultaneously here at the Road Theater Company. This is our third series of Common Ground. And what this is, is we get performers to write semi-autobiographical pieces on issues that change their life. We try to get them to do it in the now. Um, so some of them, this is their first time out. And uh, we're welcoming our stage manager, Maury Gonzalez, back to the stage. After not acting for 20 years. Yeah. Well, be kind. So, <laughs> no, she, she's terrific. They're all terrific. I thank you so much. Come and see The Rescue. It's a wonderful play. We have lots of plays. Talk to me. Talk to, to Sam Anderson. We will all tell you what's going on. And we, again, thank you for coming out to the Road Theater Company. And thank you for coming to Common Ground. steps. I'm in handcuffs behind my back. I can hear them upstairs ransacking my room. They come downstairs with evidence bags, my computer, my cell phone. This has to be a joke. No, this ain't no joke. Next thing I know, I'm in a white room, sitting on a metal chair. I'm handcuffed to this metal chair. I'm wondering, what the fuck? This big lady cop comes in and she goes, you've been arrested for identity theft and credit card fraud. I've been what? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, you have the wrong person. How is this possible? I'll tell you how this shit's possible. <laughs> I rented a room when I lived in Orange County because I couldn't afford the rent. And this motherfucker was using my computer when I was at work to take other people's credit cards and buy shit in my name on my computer and send it to my address. That's how this shit's possible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taken to another location, handcuffed hand behind my back, booking. You get mug shots. They take pictures of my tattoos. I gotta take off my jewelry. My hair's a mess. Fingerprints, DNA swabs. I become part of the system. My brain's exploding. Hey, when do I get my phone call? <laughs> and as soon as those words leave my mouth, I'm thinking, who am I going to call? <laughs> <laughs> hey, kids, guess what? Mom's in jail. <laughs> no, I didn't do this. And since those were the only people I could call, that was the call I made. Surprise! <laughs> Voicemail. <laughs> so I'm taken to the place I like to call the dungeon, handcuffed behind my back. This is a cinder block cell. Uh, about 10 people fit in here right now. Uh, cement slabs to sit on, a nasty metal toilet in the corner. Uh, and these girls are in here and they know each other. <laughs> <laughs> There's a chick sitting right next to me and she pulls out a bag of heroin from her bra and says, anybody want to do this? Uh, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> Taken down the hall, hands behind your back. Don't look around, face straight ahead to another big room. There's a window uh, in this room and a couple of shower stalls on the other side. Uh, there's two sheriffs in that window and they look at you and they say, and now you gotta strip and you gotta take a shower. I got, I got a what? <laughs> I gotta strip and take a shower. You don't really have much of a choice. So I strip. After a humiliating 
great shower. I'm taken back to the dungeon. It's been two days since I left that voicemail on my kid's phone. Um, crazed, freaked out. I can only imagine what they're thinking. Me? I'm really scared. After four days, I finally get to make a phone call. Four days. I call Angie. I kind of hope she doesn't answer, but I kind of hope she answers because I really need to talk to her. She answers. Angie, you got to get me out of here, man. I can't do this. You got you to gotta get me out of here. I can't be in here, Angie. I don't care what you do, but you got to get me out. You got to post bail. What's bail? Um, $5,000? I know she doesn't have that kind of money. I know she knows nobody that has that kind of money. But I have to ask. She says, it's OK, Mom. It's going to be OK. I love you, Ange. But you're out there. And I'm in here. And this is not OK. I feel lost. I feel broken. And I feel very alone. Uh, next thing I know, I'm getting handed these mustard colored scrubs. And by the way, orange is not the new black. <laughs> <laughs> and they, t they tell me they're going to send me to the farm. The farm? Who the fuck is the farm? <laughs> Apparently, it's the place you want to be. No, no, the place I want to be is home. Um, turns out the farm is this big dorm room full of women. 75 women with metal bunks all over the place. Uh, you don't go in with anything. You get your bunk, and if you're used to sleeping on anything but an army cot, don't roll over in your sleep because the floor is really hard. <laughs> you get a sweatshirt, you get a sheet, and a really itchy blanket. But if you wrap the sweatshirt around your blanket, it doubles as a pillow because you don't get one of those either. You really don't get anything unless people from the outside put money on your books. And then you can buy stuff, like food, um, paper, pencils, soap, toilet paper. Oh my gosh, when you get that, put your name in it and hide it, because that shit is like gold in here. <laughs> the lady in the bunk next to me, Shannon, she's really nice. She's about 60. She tries to calm me down. She sees I'm really freaked out. She tells me her family has been in and out of jail for a long time, drugs. She gives me a cup of soup. That was nice. Soup is always good. <laughs> <laughs> then you got Terry. <laughs> Terry's this big girl from Jersey. <laughs> She's like, I see you're freaked out. She's been in there a long time too, five years. Five years. She tells me it's going to be OK. Uh, she has this big S&M tat on her arm of a naked lady with a ball gag in her mouth. <laughs> really not sure I want her to be my friend. <laughs> Every day's the same. Get up at 4.30 in the morning when the fluorescent light bulbs pop on and Ryan Seacrest is blaring in the overhead speakers. <laughs> There's no sleeping through that. Don't even try. <laughs> Everybody goes to chow. I do not. I like to take those extra 30 minutes and sleep because you don't get a lot of sleep in here. Uh, when they come back, the deputies do count. Count is around so that you make sure that nobody's disappeared in this time. Uh, they make you say your bunk number and your last name. 51 Gonzalez, ma'am. And don't forget the ma'am, because that's like a cardinal sin around there. We get privileges. Privileges, uh, you go to the day room. There's a TV hanging from the ceiling. You can sit at the table and talk to the ladies. There's books. There's a little library. We have newspapers, but for some reason, they cut out some of the articles. <laughs> uh, I don't know what that's about. <laughs> it's trial day. Yeah, trial day. Trial day is when you get to go and plead your case to the judge. Not really. <laughs> it's not like when you walk into the courthouse and you're sitting there like Judge Judy and you're in the courthouse. You know. <laughs> We are taken down, hands cuffs behind our backs, um, down this narrow corridor in a teeny little elevator, claustrophobic. Um, 
And then we're put into this giant cell with about 35 people. The lawyers will come and they'll walk up and down in front of the cell. And when they call your name, you step up. And they tell you what plea you're going to get or what sentence you're going to get or what deal you're going to take. And I get this public pretender who's spouting all this legal jargon at me. And I'm thinking, could you please speak English? I, I really don't know what you're saying. And, and I didn't do anything wrong. But that doesn't matter. Every other Sunday is visitation day. That's when the family and friends come and visit you in this place. My kids say they'll come visit. I know Angie can't because she's in New York, but Heather and Jeremy say they're going to come visit. I don't really want them to see me in here. No kid should see their mom in this situation. So we hand behind our backs and we walk down this room to this other big room, and we sit with our backs in the room. And you don't talk. You don't turn around. You wait to hear your name call. I hear my name. I look over, and I see my kids sitting over there. And they're smiling, and uh, I lose it. I go sit over there with them, and all the tears that I've been holding on to for so long just come pouring out. Hey, Mom, how you doing? Hey, guys, I look like shit. <laughs> <laughs> they talk, we talk. We have a nice conversation. It's, it's nice. I gotta go back. We only get a little bit of time to spend. Um, Heather says she'll come back. I don't want you to come back because I want to be out of here. It's time to go. $51 Gonzalez. <laughs> you know, when you think about 45 days out of your life, out here, doesn't really mean much because you can go and do whatever you want and be wherever you want. No one tells you anything that what you have to do or can't do. But when you're here and you have nothing, you can't go anywhere and you can't do anything, 45 days is an eternity. And I will never stand with my hands behind my back ever again. town in the northeast of England on a street called Corporation Road. About five miles down this way are two huge chemical plants, British Steel on one side of the road and ICI on the other. And further up in the next town, Hartlepool Nuclear Power Station. The air is less than fresh, put it that way. <laughs> Almost everyone I know has at least one parent that works at one of those places. And chances are, they'll end up there too. That thought scares me more than anything. Our little house is next to a gas station opposite a bus stop, and I go to sleep every night to the sound of traffic. I live there with my four sisters and my mum and dad. Now, my parents can't afford good schools for all of us, so they've opted for homeschooling instead. So for the last 11 years, I've spent the mornings doing lessons with my mum and the afternoons running free, Riding my bike, going to the park, listening to music with my sisters. Now I have nothing to compare my life to because we're the only kids in the whole town that are homeschooled. But somehow, I know I'm experiencing something really special and that I get a chance to do something different with my life. Be someone different. My parents' bedroom looks out onto a school and sometimes I hide underneath the curtains press my face against the glass, watching all the school kids during recess. 
Their world is so strange. Their interactions so foreign. They all look like little black beetles in their identical uniforms, scuttling back and forth, chattering in a language that I don't understand. And I don't think I want to. <laughs> <laughs> then one day, during the summer before I turned 12, my mother announced that she's going back to work. It's hard raising five children on one teacher's salary in the northeast of England. And we are so tired of being broke. So, it's off to school I must go. The arrangements are made at the local Catholic school. The books bought, the uniform acquired, and just like that, my world is blown apart. Gone are my earrings made out of safety pins. Gone are my sneakers with the rainbow laces. Gone are my favorite jeans, perfect for climbing trees and scaling walls. Gone is my turquoise mascara and green nail polish. And in their place, white socks, patent leather shoes, and lots and lots of itchy navy. <laughs> As I stare at myself in the mirror on that first day of school in September, I don't recognize me. Well, the first day of school's rough. Someone finds out my school skirts from a thrift store. Inch the instant social death before I even knew that was a deadly disease. And, and, and I don't know how to act. I've never been to school. You've never been to school? That's a fucking crime, that is. Do the police know? <laughs> <laughs> and boys. So many boys. And, and, and rules. And bells. A bell for every chunk of my life that's been divided up and handed back to me on a piece of white paper called a schedule. And they call us by our last names like we're in the army. Hand up before you speak, McEwen. No chewing gum, McEwen. Walk, don't run, McEwen. And tuck in your shirt and call me sir. And no, you can't use the bathroom or draw in the margins or write with purple ink. And is that makeup you're wearing? And I said no talking, McEwen. Every year, my family and I go to visit a friend's farm in Wales. During the autumn break, the trip is the highlight of my year. The air is so fresh, it makes my nostrils tingle. And I wake up every morning to cows outside my bedroom window. The farm is in the middle of the vast rolling hills of the Brecon Beacons, 500 miles of almost untouched countryside ancient land. And there are herds of wild horses on those mountains, and sometimes if you're lucky, they appear out of the mist like ghosts, shaking their manes and stamping their feet. They fill me with a mixture of terror and wonder. I've been around horses my whole life, but these ones are different. They roam free. So this year, after my first disastrous term at Catholic school. I can't wait to tear off the uniform, get on my wellies, and get to the farm. The 300 mile drive southwest in our old blue Ford Cortina never seemed longer. <laughs> Usually I join in the games my sisters are playing, but this year I just want to stare out the window, willing us to get there faster. There's a horse on the farm called Rowan, an old horse. She never goes faster than a plod. But me and my sisters love her anyway, and at every opportunity, we take her down the lane, out to the common, and take turns riding her around in slow circles. Now, I'm sibling number four of five, so it always feels like an age before it's my turn. And this year's no different, and I stand in the chilly air, stamping my feet, impatiently waiting for my sister to be done. Finally, it's my turn. And Rowan and I are making our slow circles around the common. When suddenly she stops, she throws back her head, makes a small snickering sound. It's so faint I barely catch it. Then out of nowhere she's off, charging across the common towards the hills. 
Now, I've never gotten Rowan to go faster than a walk before, and suddenly she's charging a full tilt. I'm terrified, clinging on for dear life. I'm desperately trying to adjust to our new speed. I've been bolted on before, but this is different. Rowan is like a horse possessed. Now, I know I've got to try to stop her. As Rowan picks up speed and the wind's whipping past us, I can hear my sister's stern voice in my head. Pull the reins! Saw the reins if you have to, but get that horse under control! But I don't do that. I ignore the voice. I ignore every riding lesson I've ever had. Instead of trying to stop her, I lean forward. I cling tighter to her mane. I press my legs harder against her heaving body and sweats foaming on both of us as we charge up the hill and out into the wilderness. And that's where I see them, the herd of wild horses in the distance, hanging there in the mist like ghosts. And suddenly I know exactly what I have to do, and I know exactly where Rowan is heading. As we gallop past a shallow pond, I take my feet out of the stirrups, release my hands from the reins, and let myself fall. I land in the pond with a splash and watch as Rowan disappears over the hill and is gone. Stand, inspect myself. Aside from a wet backside, I'm unharmed. <laughs> Heart's still hammering in my chest. I turn a full circle. And that's when it hits me. It's silent. Completely silent. It's a silence you don't experience in a two and a half bedroom house that you share with six other people <laughs> next to a bus stop opposite a gas station in a small industrial town in the northeast of England. <laughs> and a silence you certainly don't experience in my new school with the screeching chairs and banging doors and endless bells. my feet, throw back my head, and start to scream. I scream longer and louder than I've ever screamed in my life. I scream for Rowan, for myself, for every kid in that school dragged through childhood by bells and schedules and uniforms broken and shaped and molded and funneled straight into those chemical plants on Corporation Road. I scream until I have no breath left in my body. And then I keep screaming. I don't stop until I see my sister's head bobbing closer on the horizon as she's running towards me, her eyes wide. Screaming your head off in the middle of the countryside isn't a very British thing to do. <laughs> asked if I'm all right. I just nod silently. I'm unsure if I even have a voice left. And when I discover I do, I tell her Rowan bolted on me and I tried everything, just everything I could to try to stop her. <laughs> going down. I'm in the bath when I hear her come back. And I submerge myself under the water so I don't have to hear the sound of the gate being locked behind her. A few days later, I'm back at school, back in the uniform, back on the line, shirt tucked in, no gum, hand up before you speak. A bell to sit, a bell to stand, a bell to walk, eat, 
Don't walk, run. But something's different now. I know how fast I can go. And I know how loud I can be. <laughs> and I can see the wild horses in the distance shaking their manes and stamping their feet. And although our last desperate race for freedom had been futile and cut short, and Rowan and I are both locked back inside our paddocks, it doesn't matter. Because I know what's over the horizon, waiting for me, hanging there in the mist like ghosts. Dad, if I had to kill someone, will you hate me? <laughs> My son Gabriel is in his final year at the United States Naval Academy. He's about to be commissioned as an officer. And I look into his eyes. He's crying like when he was five years old and wanted to climb up on my shoulders. Dad, Dad, help me get closer to the moon. <laughs> have to kill someone. That sends me straight back to my 18th birthday. I've registered for the draft as a non-combatant conscientious objector. <laughs> I'd serve, but I wouldn't carry a weapon. It's because of my dad. In 1942, he's a struggling actor, subsisting on avocados and brown bread, and studying with Max Reinhardt in Hollywood when he's drafted. <laughs> he's not a conscientious objector, but he serves as a medic in World War II. I want to be like my dad. 1968, I'm a theater major at San Francisco State. <laughs> <laughs> Vietnam is no longer a page six story. Tens of thousands of Americans and over a million Vietnamese have died. We produced Requiem, a play about six American soldiers who took part in the My Lai Massacre. I play PFC Mike Terry. I discover how a gentle Isle of farm boy can learn to hate so deeply that he rapes, mutilates, and murders. My father was from Iowa. 1970, December 1st, 4 a.m., I'm standing under a street lamp in the Mission District waiting for the San Francisco Chronicle delivery truck. The people passing by have no clue that my future hangs on what I'm about to see in that paper. I scream at them for being so insensitive. Well, not out loud. <laughs> an inner screen. <laughs> because I've earned my diploma, I've lost my draft deferment, so I am fresh meat for the selective service. But who's going to selectively serve? Well, today they're instituting a birth date lottery. Whoopee. The first third, one through 122, are screwed. They'll be drafted. The middle third is stuck in limbo, and the last third can go join a commune or get a job at IBM. <laughs> My birth date is February 14th. Here's the lottery truck. Okay, I, I, I paw through the paper to the lottery chart. Okay, okay, February 14th. Feb, for, Feb. Four. My, my number is four. Abraham Lincoln said, the final decisions are made in silent rooms where every man must skin his own skunk. <laughs> I now have a skunk to skin. At 18, I chose non-combatant, but me lie in the last four years of this war have changed my thinking. I mean, what does it matter whether I ship the bullets or shoot them? I'd still be in it. 
thinking about my dad. And I realized, if I were my father in 1942, I would serve. If I'm really conscientious, I have to admit to myself that I am not a conscientious objector. But I'm not my father. And it's not 1942. I will not serve in this war. Months pass, still waiting to hear from the Selective Service, or the SS, as I now call them. <laughs> <laughs> My home is a converted postal van. I'm, I'm working for Diney Wash Diapers. I'm a diaper dispatcher. Do you, do you know how many diapers a baby goes through in a week? <laughs> 84. That's one every two hours. I like the owner. She, she publishes a newsletter full of diapering tips and any more stuff. <laughs> I smile every time I slip that newsletter into a bag of warm, clean diapers. By summer, I'm in the Sierra Nevada fighting fires. Finally, notice from the SS report for pre-induction physical Oakland. I ignore the notice. Hey, I'm fighting for my country. I'm fighting fires. I'm jumping out of helicopters. Well, I mean, the choppers have landed when I jump out, but I'm sure. <laughs> SS is notoriously tough, so I lied to him and tell him I've moved to Oregon. And for $50, uh, Dr. Banerjee writes a letter stating Mr. Collison has anger issues, and if drafted, may shoot his commanding officer. <laughs> Still waiting. Still waiting. Finally, the SS orders me to report for pre-induction physical Portland. I head north and my postal van is pouring the whole way up. I stay with a friend in Eugene. My roommate is a wet goat. <laughs> <laughs> Next morning as I stand naked in line with hundreds of other naked men, the phrase, lambs to the slaughter comes to mind. Fresh scrub farm boys, Clueless stoners, my Native American guy. I, I, I think the, the Portland SS will be much mellower than the Oakland SS, so I'm, I'm counting on my $50 letter to get me deferred. <laughs> I, I, I hand to the SS guy, he glances at it. <laughs> really? <laughs> Stamps my paperwork. Fit to serve! I wonder if Dr. Banerjee will give me a refund. <laughs> <laughs> Back to Diddy Wash and still waiting. I, I try on my father's old uniform just to see how it feels. Makes my mother cry. Should I serve like my father did? Am I a coward? What are my choices? Okay, there's Canada, but then I'll never be able to come home again. Uh, Got to have connections to get into the National Guard. Braces, I can't afford them. A friend suggests I get fucked the army tattooed on my hand. <laughs> or there's uh, two years in Lompoc Federal Penitentiary. Hmm. I hear they have uh, tennis courts. <laughs> <laughs> Early on, things get serious. Report for induction physical open. See. Portland was my pre-induction physical. Oakland is my, well, if I pass this time, it's either Vietnam or prison. I, I hear if you swallow aluminum foil, it looks really bad on your x-ray. <laughs> <laughs> or, or some guy got deferred by shitting on himself. I, I, I find a draft counseling center staffed by any war vets. Before I can say a word, the, the vet at the, at the desk asks, how tall are you? 6'3". Uh, Wait. And about one, 162. Can you lose 24 pounds? It's a month before my appointment. You get below 138, they cannot take you. <laughs> so I stop eating. <laughs> my appointment falls a week before Thanksgiving. <laughs> So 
Sunset Magazine is full of pornographic <laughs> images. <and pies. laughs> I have a nice slice of turkey and spit it out. I don't trust the SS. Maybe they've lowered the weight limit so they can draft more skinny guys. I'm working on my manic depressive act to back up my $50 letter. I buy diuretics in case I need to lose a little more water weight. Stop bathing. Day before my appointment, no liquids. I'm down to 132. I've lost 30 pounds. Oakland Induction Center, same deal, naked men. <laughs> we use our paperwork as fig leaves. <laughs> I'm sweating out what's left of me. If I pass this time and refuse induction, the FBI will arrest me on the spot. If I have any shit left, I'm going to lose it. The guy behind me is staring. What the fuck happened to you, man? <laughs> I swallowed a hand grenade. <laughs> the x-rays will prove it. That's cool. <laughs> Finally, a very bored woman in a cubicle stamps my paperwork. What age? Temporary disqualification. She gives me one of those little tickets like you get at a charity raffle. Select your service regulations required that if we hold you for more than four hours, we must provide you with a meal. Now wait, you said I was disqualified. Temporary. You may be recalled in six months. Your x-rays may confirm a permanent disqualification. Come back after lunch, cafeterias across the street. The special today is fried chicken. <laughs> I know fried chicken is the last thing I should eat to break a fast, but hey, I have won this meal. <laughs> Sharply dressed young man sits across from me with his plate, plate of fried chicken. They give me bo F. Bo F. That's a permanent disqualification. I'm intensely curious. <laughs> Psychiatric reasons. <laughs> Man, it would have flopped me if they know where I work. Langley Porter Psychiatric Institute. <laughs> Man, I'm so happy. I can't even eat. You want mine? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> off both plates and a slice of mince pie for good measure. Oh. <laughs> After lunch, I report back to the SS. They didn't find a hand grenade or anything permanent. You may be recalled in six months. Oh, God. Am I going to have to be a serial anorexic? <laughs> Reaching into my mailbox now feels like sticking my arm down the throat of an alligator. I'm going to pull out that dreaded SS letter. They're going to call me back. Six months. Nothing. Back to firefighting. A year. January 1973, Walter Cronkite says, the draft is over. I'm free. In 85, I visit the Vietnam Memorial Wall to pay my respects to 58,318 Americans who didn't come home. 96, Gabriel is born. So today, I've regained the 30 pounds, plus another 30, just to show, yes, yes, I'm not afraid. <laughs> Finally, the call I've been waiting for comes. Hey, hey, Dad, guess, guess what? I got my first choice. Naval aviation. My son will learn to land a fighter jet on the heaving deck of an aircraft carrier. Gabriel knows my story. Everything from the wet goat to the hand grenade. <laughs> Dad, 
Jade, are, are, are you ashamed of me that I, that I didn't serve? No, Dad. You did what you believed was right. I dream of my father standing naked in a forest raking pine needles. I wrap him in his khaki coat. I dream of my son lying in his back in the night sky above a darkened sea. I am bracketed by generations that served or will serve. I did not serve. I skinned my own skunk. And as to my son's question, if I have to kill someone, will you hate me? Climb up on my shoulder, Gabe. Get closer to the moon. You know what your best friend Mark said about that now, don't you? You know, Stanford University put out a, a report that chronic use of that shit can definitely cause short-term and long-term memory loss. And I'm still fairly certain you can develop eyeball tumors and you're probably going to get free tits. <laughs> awesome! Here's to free tits! May the third one make up for the weak-ass performance of the first two! <laughs> Michael, moving you out of this place is one thing, but I cannot 
not believe, A, that you kept all of this shit. I mean, look. Merry Christmas. I still love you. <laughs> I can't believe that your parents are letting us take anything we want. I mean, honestly, if this was my child, don't touch it. It's mine. <laughs> I couldn't have done that. You know, Lori told me what you said, by the way. Just now. I mean, obviously you can realize this is information I could have used a year ago, right? I mean, I just assumed that you knew I felt the same way. I mean, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Well, at least I thought it was. I mean, what, you know? If we want to say anything, that's ridiculous. So I guess now you know how I feel. <laughs> it's actually kind of cool though, right? I mean, being dead, I mean, let's look at the bright side. You can be in like nine places at once. <laughs> you can be with me, you can be with Mark and his weird fucking Stanford studies and your parents, your kids. It's pretty awesome. Oh, and I do want to thank you for saving me the daunting task of having to choose between you and Denzel, so that's going to be pretty easy now. <laughs> <laughs> He's really going to be stoked. <laughs> I don't know, maybe Mark's right. I mean, Stanford people are pretty smart, so... I don't think I can afford to lose any of these memories. Give it to Louis. He can't remember shit as it is. From that day forward, I have always said exactly what is on my mind. And I say how I feel because as terrifying, terrifying as it can be to tell somebody how you feel about them, it does not even hold a candle to regret.
my mother's favorite song. All I ever wanted to hear my mom say is, I love you. My mother was generous, inspiring, complicated. <laughs> Born in Tennessee, by way of Washington, D.C. and Brazil, she landed in San Francisco. <laughs> Mother, gorgeous and enticing, she had 13 marriage proposals. <laughs> Very ambitious, she was the first woman commercial real estate broker in San Francisco, and a down and dirty street fighter. Oh man! She would say things to people that would make your socks roll up and down. <laughs> I never saw my mother without a more cigarette attached to her long fingers. <laughs> Even in our family photos, she was holding a cigarette. <laughs> we learned right off the bat, don't talk. I've had enough of this. Go get your sweater. We're going to the doctor. I don't want to go to the doctor. Sandra Michelle Gillette, sweater now. You need help. <laughs> <laughs> doctor C, there's something wrong with my daughter. She won't do what I say. <laughs> and playing with imaginary friends. <laughs> Leave her with me for an hour. Find out what's wrong with her. There's nothing wrong with me. Don't talk about her. <laughs> Dr. C, fix her. <laughs> Mickey, come sit over here. Is there anything bothering you? Do you have friends? Friends? Yes. What do you think is stopping you? I think the other kids are afraid of me because I have a rash all over my body. It's eczema, and when I start to itch, I can't stop scratching. Do they give you medicine for it? They put me in the hospital. They tape wet bandages all over my body so I can't scratch. When I scratch too hard, my skin rips off, and it gets sticky, and I can't open my arms. The nurse gives my mom tar soap. I don't mean to scream. It hurts. What happens right before you start to, to itch? I, I don't know. Hey, let's go downstairs to the soda counter and have a milkshake. How does that sound? Okay. You know, the doctor never found anything disturbing about my personality. <laughs> and I liked going for milkshakes and hot fudge sundaes once a week. <laughs> At age 10, I was sent to a boarding school. To my grandmother's, to my aunt's, and to a performing arts boarding school. When I returned at 17, everything was different. Who was I? The unknown sibling that didn't belong. I never lived with my family again. But mom and I developed a routine of talking on the phone every Sunday morning. I would never call her in the evening. After 5 p.m. was mom's drinking time. <laughs> there was the before five person and the after five person. I would never call her after five. It wasn't safe. 
while she was drunk, she had a really bad habit of writing nasty letters to her children. <laughs> Dear Mickey, you are fat. I hate fat people. <laughs> Why do you eat so much? I have always been slender. Men tell me how beautiful I am. Maybe if you lost weight, you'd find somebody who'd love you. I can't stand fat people. I can't even look at them. I hope you change who you are. Mom. Hi, Mom. <laughs> I got your letter. Why do you send things like this? I have to tell you what I think. I'm so happy. And I go out to the mailbox and I find a letter telling me how awful I am. This is exactly why I mail them. I don't want to hear how you feel. <laughs> I need to tell you something. <laughs> and you need to listen to me. If you ever, ever, Send me another letter like this. You can tell your friends that your daughter is dead because I will never speak to you again for the rest of my life. You will never find love. You will never be successful. You will be alone and sad for the rest of your life. Your spirit has already been broken. No, it hasn't. No, I'm crossing you in style someday. Ah! Now I have to buy a new phone. <laughs> <laughs> but I never got another letter. <laughs> <laughs> One day I got a phone call from my brother Rusty. He found Mom collapsed on the floor. I hopped on a plane and came down to be with her. I slept in a cot in her hospital room. Mom refused to talk to anyone. She would purse her lips and turn her head angrily when the doctor asked her a question. When the doctor told her they were sending her to a nursing home and she would never be able to return to her condo, she chose to die. She was gone by 10 a.m. the next morning. She never told me she loved me. Three weeks later, I flew down to San Francisco to start packing up mom's things. Sitting in the twilight, looking out her window, from high on top of Nob Hill, I saw both the Golden Gate Bridge and the Bay Bridge. I looked down at Huntington Park, the Grace Cathedral where my brothers went to school. The next morning, I called my sister to find out when she was arriving to help. And she said, you don't know what happened, do you? 9-11 happened. All flights were canceled. I was nervous being by myself, so I threw everything I could into mom's car, including five boxes of books, and I drove back home to Seattle. I put the books in my basement, and there they stayed for 11 years. In 2008, I left Seattle. The books traveled with me down to LA. I put them in my garage, and they stayed there for another five years. Springtime, and my church in Pasadena announced a book sale. <laughs> I packed up a few of Mom's books to donate. One Sunday, Alberta, one of our senior congregants, came up to me and said, I bought this book at the book sale a year and a half ago, and it's been sitting in my trunk ever since. When I finally took it out yesterday, the wind blew it open, and this fell out. It's addressed to Mickey Gillette. Is that you? 
the envelope was sealed, no stamp. <laughs> my mom's handwriting, my address in Seattle. Dear Mickey, yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, today is a gift, that's why they call it the present. I love you, Mom. Oh, dream maker, <laughs> my heart breaker. Wherever you're going, I'm going your way. To drift and up to see the world. There's such a lot of world to see. We're after the same rainbows and waiting round the bend. My huckleberry friend, Moon River, and me. installments of Common Ground here at the road and have been floored by the bravery of these artists, the compelling stories they were willing to tell, and I thought, nope. <laughs> <laughs> significant experience of my life and show you how formative it was for me or, or elevate it to make a statement. It just, everything seemed to fall short. Nothing seemed worth divulging that much. And which do I choose? What do I choose? When I was 12 and bullied naked in the girls' locker room for having a fire crotch, the ginger people are very tragic and bullied. <laughs> when I was in high school and my sister stole my boyfriend and my mom told me not to be selfish and let her be happy. <laughs> jail for 30 hours, when I fell down an entire flight of stairs at a college party dressed as a loofah. <laughs> when my friend hung himself the day after I directed him in a major school assignment and the weight of that final performance haunts you. When I cut my own bangs on picture day, <laughs> you talk about a choice that sticks with you. <laughs> I can't choose one. I can't choose one thing. I'm not one of those things. I'm all of those things. So what does that leave us with? The person you see before you. <laughs> a 20-something actress slash bartender and hating it. <laughs> not really, but really. <laughs> Opinion, but everyone 
keeps telling me to enjoy this time. And I'm like, can it, Joyce? I'm drowning in student loans and broken dreams, and I don't have the joy of children or a vacation home to distract me. <laughs> I do have distractions. Work. I'm at work. I was actually at work a few months ago. And this man came to sit down at my bar, and so I frankly greeted him, and he said, man, I just love him young and bubbly. <laughs> <laughs> it's gross. <laughs> he asked me what my name was, and a little less bubbly. I said, Jennifer? <laughs> no, honey, your full name. Nope. <laughs> Jennifer's enough. You're right. You're right, darling. You are enough. You'd be enough for anyone with all that attitude and your full figure. I would totally eat you out. Oh, I know. Have I made you feel uncomfortable? <laughs> a moment in which the victim can be their own. That's pretty special. You may not be willing to rip open my deepest wounds, whether for fear of judgment or self-preservation, I can't be certain. But I also know that it's because I'm not one of those things. I'm all of them. I'm not one story in the whole picture. And if you're someone looks at a person, disenfranchised or not, and you see one thing, and you capitalize on that difference, that makes you someone who doesn't see the whole picture. And I don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> I will seek to help you understand, because we're hopeless without that. Just like I hope people help me understand when I fall short, because Lord knows I'm 